there is this ancient parable of a group of blind men trying to describe an elephant. Each one is touching a different part of the animal's body. The guy touching the side thinks it's a wall. The guy touching the leg thinks it's a tree. The one touching the tusk thinks it's a spear. All of the descriptions of the elephant are different based on limited experience. Our early description of the vault particle as a barrel was based on limited data. What would the actual 3D structure of the vault look like? Is there an elephant in the room? Hi, I'm Lenny Rome, the vault guy. My passion is a common particle of the human cell. It's called a vault. This is episode nine of an educational course on vaults called Lessons with Lenny. It assumes that you've been following along and builds on previous episodes. So if you're new to this channel, all past episodes are linked below. Today, I want to dive into vault structure by covering three things. First, I want to introduce a new collaborator and explain a very useful technique called cryo-electron microscopy. Second, I want to show you our first three-dimensional structure of a vault. And finally, I'll show you the location of the various vault components in the vault. Stick around. You'll be surprised by the simplicity of the vault structure. In 1996, two really interesting things happened in the vault world. First, a magazine called Science News published an article about vaults and featured one of Nancy's photos on the cover. The article was written by a young up-and-coming science writer named John Travis. John is currently the news managing editor at the premier journal Science, and this past June, he wrote another article about vaults. I'll put a link below. That same year, we started working on vault structure with a young, newly recruited UCLA faculty member, Phoebe Stewart. Phoebe's expertise was a new procedure called cryo-electron microscopy and image reconstruction. Our collaboration lasted more than 10 years. Phoebe is now a professor at Case Western Reserve University in the School of Medicine. Our first work on examining the structure of vaults by cryo-EM was led by a graduate student in Phoebe's lab, Lawrence Kong. I want to use this football and this rubber ducky to explain cryo-EM. This technique has lately become the go-to method for solving large structures at the nanoscale. In order to view a particle by cryo-EM, a very thin layer of the sample is rapidly cooled to minus 183 degrees centigrade. The cooling is so quick that water crystals don't form. The frozen sample is then viewed, still frozen, in an EM. When individual vaults were viewed under these conditions, the images did look somewhat like the EMs I've showed you before, but they had even less detail, and there appeared to be some different shapes. Some were round, some were ovoid. This was because the vaults were frozen as they were tumbling around in three-dimensional space. If we look at the football from the side, we see that it looks ovoid, but when viewed on the, by the end, it looks round. The real power of cryo-EM is the application of image reconstruction. Let's look at the rubber ducky. But if instead of the actual duck, we only had pictures of the duck, that were taken from every angle, side, bottom, top. We could gather thousands of these two-dimensional images, store them in a big computer, and analyze them using a mathematical treatment called Fourier transformation. Fourier transformation is a way to mathematically describe an image and get back the original image if you have enough information. The image you get back is called a 3D reconstruction. It would look like the 3D version of the duck. Lawrence's first reconstructions of the vault 
were from about 1,300 individual particle images, and the 3D structures he obtained did not have a great deal of detail. In terminology of structural biology, we would say that the particle was solved at a relatively low resolution. One of the units that structural biologists use to describe resolution are called angstroms. An angstrom is one-tenth of a nanometer. The symbol is a letter of the Swedish alphabet. The unit is named after the Swedish physicist Anders Angstrom, who was born in 1814. The unit was first used in the 1880s to describe the wavelength of light. Let me show you a model of Lawrence's first 3D vault. It was solved at a relatively low resolution of 30 angstroms, or about 300 nanometers. We could not identify individual protein chains, but we could see the general shape and size of the vault. Today, structural biologists generally use nanometers instead of angstroms. Three different views of the vault are shown in this picture. Lawrence measured the vault length, 70 nanometers, and the width, 42 nanometers. When Lawrence published this vault reconstruction in 1999, we were disappointed that the 3D vault didn't get selected for the journal cover. However, a couple of years later, we found out that his paper was the inspiration for an artist named Julie Newdahl to paint a picture that was featured on the cover of the EMBO Journal, a publication of the European Molecular Biology Organization. Julie called her painting the transportation of raw through a vault protein out of the night sky and into the birth of the sunrise. You know, I think this cover would grow great on the wall there. Cryo reconstruction also allows you to look at cut sections through the particle. Here's one cut lengthwise and one cut at the waist. These constructions revealed that the vault was a very thin, hollow, barrel-like structure with two protruding caps and a slightly invaginated waist. The internal volume of the vault indicated that the particle was one of the largest containers found in a cell. Lawrence estimated that you could theoretically fit about 350 average-sized proteins inside a vault. Although the vault particle looked hollow inside, that turned out to be an artifact of the image averaging, which subtracts away density that's not found in the exact same place in each particle. When we viewed a slice through the cryo-EM data, we could see density inside the vault particle, the green and blue shapes here. And we speculated that this weak density was probably the vault contents. We were also able to study the difference between normal vaults and vaults treated with an enzyme to degrade the vault RNA. This data suggested that the vault RNA was inside the particle, distributed very close to the top and bottom of the structure. Remember in my last video when I told you that we had isolated vaults from mice whose TEP1 protein had been knocked out? Well, by examining the difference between these vaults and normal vaults, Lawrence showed that the TEP1 protein was closely associated with the vault RNA up near the cap of the vault. Since vaults are symmetric around the waist, this placed the vRNA and the TEP1 protein inside the vault at the top and bottom, as illustrated by the green and orange blobs drawn over the density slice shown here. Later, we did similar studies with vaults isolated from mice with their VPAR protein knocked out, and we found that the VPAR protein was near the waist, shown by the pink blobs. How awesome is that? With more and more data collected, we could finally start to see the elephant revealing itself in its full glory. I'm Lenny Rome, the Vault Guy. Join me in the next video, where I show you how we used cryo-EM to locate the position of the major vault protein 
in the vault shell. We were really surprised to discover that the entire vault shell was made from multiple copies of MVP. Don't forget to like and subscribe and feel free to leave me a comment. I love hearing your thoughts about vaults.